ഇത്രയും ഓപ്പൺ ആയിരിച്ചു എന്ന് എനിക്ക് അറിയാം பண்ணிரலாம் சார் ஓகே சார் ஓகே குட் மார்னிங் டு ஒன் ஆண்ட் ஆல் பிரசன்ஸ் ஹியர் டுடே ஹேவ் தி டுடே वी ஹேவ் எ வெபினார் ஆன் பவர் கிரிட் ரெசிலியன்சி இன் யுஎஸ்ஏ ஆன் பிகாஃப் ஆஃப் தி மேனேஜ்மென்ட் பிரின்சிபல் சார் எச்ஓடி மேம் அண்ட் தி ஃபேக்கல்டி மெம்பர்ஸ் ஐ வெல்கம் மிஸ்டர் வினோத் குமார் சேகர் ப்ராஜெக்ட் மேனேஜர் Uh, and also i welcome all the external participants from other engineering college thank you uh, thank you vinod for accepting our uh, invitation thank you and i request uh, sabri ma'am to give the uh, introduce about our chief guest thank you sir very good morning to one and all present here on behalf of the management the principal sir head of the department faculty members and students I uh, have immense pleasure in welcoming Mr. Vinod Kumar Shekhar and introducing our guest to today's session. Mr. Vinod Kumar Shekhar has received his B.E. in Electrical and Electronics from RMK Engineering College in 2012 and Master of Science in Energy Systems from Northeastern University in Boston. He manages the implementation and program operations for various utility incentive programs. With over six years of experience as a project manager, he has provided energy consulting services for various high-performance buildings while assisting utilities, design professionals and building owners in meeting their energy efficiency goals. His work includes a wide range of commercial, education and multifamily buildings. He also currently serves as a board member for the Mid-East uh, energy, energy Alliance based in uh, Chicago. He is a Certified Project Management Professional, Certified Energy Manager and a Lead Accredited Professional in Building Design and Construction. And he is currently working as a Project Manager at Wilden USA. Welcome, sir. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, Sabri, ma'am. Thank you for introducing our chief guest. Now, I am entering our session to our Mr. Vinod Kumar. Vinod Kumar, you can stand to your session, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, sir. and Thank thanks you. thanks for this uh, opportunity to uh, be with you all virtually and uh, share some of my uh, experience and journey um, over the past 8 years um, after i graduated from um rmk with my bachelor's um so um i hope everyone's staying safe and uh, comfortable um, at home and um, thanks for joining in and um so they gave a good uh, introduction um, about what i do so i also had some initial slides prepared for that so i'll just uh, uh, breeze over that real quick so um i um did my undergrad in electrical engineering at uh, rmk engineering college um and uh, completed my engineering in 2012 and after that uh, i um started work work at um kc engineering um it was a transmission distribution company and uh, i got this job through the campus placement um and i was posted in mumbai where i was working a couple of years as um an electrical design engineer and after that i started pursuing my masters um and um went to um us in 2014 um and during my masters i also had an opportunity to uh, work for a utility company um the utility company that i worked for is called eversource energy um this is when i say utility company throughout this presentation uh, those are like your uh, tneb or any other um electric service provider um so they run a lot of uh, programs uh, that help the a uh, community as well as uh, apart from uh, providing energy s- services to the uh, customers and uh, during my uh, term at my college i also was uh, leading the student chapter and i organized the first northeastern energy conference which was um, a highlight during my um, graduate program and then after that i started uh, after i graduated top of my class i started working for an um, energy, energy company in boston um and also was uh, involved in some of the local uh, professional chapters that help 
um, helped me in net networking and uh, was able to spread my connections. Um, so one advice I would give to um, all of you is to keep your LinkedIn uh, account uh, up to date so that um, you could keep track of all your uh, credentials and all your um, education um, and affiliation to date so that will help your networking um, career as well. Um, my company that I work with has uh, a lot of branches across the United States. So I was working in Boston for a year after I graduated from my master's program. Then I was given an option to move. Um, so right now I'm located in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, and that's where I'm talking to you all from. Um, and uh, this is how my transition was from going from a city like such atmosphere to kind of a village type scenario. So um, it was a different kind of transition, but um, I do like traveling and exploring. So I've covered um, some part of the states so far, uh, shown in green. And uh, uh, I'll give you some additional uh, affiliation that I um, have. Um, I have my uh, lead accreditation. Uh, this is leadership in energy and environmental design for um, building design and construction. Um, this is similar to the Indian Green Building Council, if you have heard of that. Um, and they help uh, promote sustainability in building design um, across the globe. And um, I also have um, my certification from Project Management Institute for um, project management and also um, a certified energy management training um, certificate, um, which um, they have um, credential holders across the globe as well. Um, and I also am part of a, a board member for the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, and uh, this is a nonprofit uh, with over $3 million revenue, and they focus in protecting energy efficiency interests and help educate the um, politicians about the importance of um, energy efficiency and also um, provide training in the region. Um, so uh, as part of the board member, I kind of oversee some of their policies and spendings um, and uh, provide my assistance to them. And what uh, my company is over 1,200 employee and uh, with about $270 million uh, in revenue. And we focus a lot in the energy and sustainability sector. So we have different verticals or sectors of our business, uh, which focuses on grid optimization, energy efficiency, energy planning for utility companies, and also administer some of the utility programs um, in the United States. So I'll share some of those uh, concepts and also what measures the uh, utility companies are taking to protect uh, the grid reliability. So um, there are different components to our building sector and uh, the gist of all uh, business units is to focus on sustainability and energy. And what I mean by sustainability is an intersection of people, planet, and profit. Um, so there are solutions that are acceptable for the planet and profit, but it's not acceptable for the people. Um, so it's, it's always um, important to find that um, intersection uh, where you're making all those three um, criteria um, reliable. Um, and we also um, take a lot of pride in working uh, to prevent climate change. And we have this uh, meter. Um, so based on the projects we complete and the amount of carbon reduction we uh, calculate, uh, this is a meter that um, shows how the equivalent amount of trees planted. So this is the picture from yesterday that they, they shared during the company meeting uh, this morning here. Um, so we take, take pride in um, help uh, prevent climate change and uh, help prevent global warming. Um, so 
if I if I'm talking about grids, um, I cannot um, have a presentation without renewable energy or battery storage. Um, so this is how I envision the future of grids uh, is more incorporating more renewables into the uh, mix and also having battery storage. And as we start in implementing more um, renewable energy into the grid, you'd start uh, fuel prices go down and also help reduce carbon emissions. Um, but uh, what I want to say is that not one particular um, solution or one particular technology could be uh, a, a solution to the problem. So for example, um, about 42% of the electricity from um, the grid comes from wind energy in the state that I live in. And um, in California, especially, you could see there's, there's a lot of solar potential in that part of the country. So if you look at the grid uh, portfolio, you could see that um, during the afternoon time, when they have so much solar panels and solar installation um, installed, um, the, the load on the grid drastically um, reduces. So you are having a lot of generation uh, going on. So the, the demand for power is going down a lot. So the, this kind of is called the duct curve projection. So, um, and then once people come back from work and uh, there's the sun's not shining anymore, you'd see that increase in the load demand. So uh, to avoid this issue, um, storage is uh, one um, additional component that, um, that we have to be thinking about. So this is called the duct curve. And in the Midwest where I live in, uh, we have sort of an alligator curve, uh, and this is mostly predicted by the wind patterns. Um, so you might not get power from, uh, you know, the solar panels um, during night or sometimes. Uh, we've had some cases in uh, the western part of the country where during uh, night times uh, when there's a lot of wind generation, um, people, the utility companies pay the customers to use energy. So they might, they might end up having negative energy prices. Um, so to resolve this issue, um, the utilities are thinking uh, a lot into energy storage and looking at uh, a grid size of up to two, two to three megawatt in energy storage technologies. Um, and uh, a good approach to um, any uh, system design is uh, building from a, a bottom to top. Um, so first we need to focus on energy conservation. Uh, this is more on a behavioral changes like turning off the appliance when you leave the room or uh, turning off the air conditioner when you're not using or not taking long showers when you're just visiting a, a hotel. Um, and then comes energy efficiency. These uh, energy efficiency is um, using less energy to get the same amount of work done. So it's switching to uh, LED technology or uh, implementing some um, programmable thermostats that could kind of um, predict your occupancy pattern in the buildings and reduce the overall energy in the, um, and energy use. And then um, adding renewable energy. So if you're designing a system, um, energy conservation and energy efficiency should come into mind first. Um, the way I think of it is if you have a bucket of water, you have to fix the hole in the bucket before you start adding any clean water into the bucket. Um, so that's kind of the approach or mindset um, we have. Sir, and, I have a uh, doubt. Sir, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, we have uh, the main aim of uh, power, uh, power supply is uh, we need to provide a reliable supply right. to the customers. So what does this exactly of resiliency means? Uh, already we, we do have this uh, motto in mind and uh, we are focusing on that when doing this uh, uh, work towards this uh, reliable supply to the consumers. What is this exactly right. of the resil resiliency means? 
So resiliency is uh, tackling um, both expected and unexpected events. So say in, in case of um, an earthquake or a, a tornado, uh, your local plant has to shut down. Um, your system has to be capable of uh, sustaining or self-generating uh, power to handle critical uh, facilities like hospitals um, or any data centers. So it's it's not about uh, not only about reliability um, and instead of having a single source like a power plant, um, this resiliency is uh, more. Uh, distributing the um, energy sources throughout the state so that even if uh, a major uh, pr production plan fails, you have some backup um, so that your critical systems are still running. So it's something like a UPS that you have for your computer. So even if the main power shuts off, it's not just um, the UPS, then you have generator for rebuilding. Um, so it's more of a system um, uh, pr system uh, protection is what I was getting to. Does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's what I was getting to for, for resiliency. Um, you have different components for that um, problem is through buildings um, that consume about 40% of your overall um, energy and also buildings consume about 70% of the electricity. Um, and they are also re responsible for about one third of the greenhouse gas emissions. And I could also share uh, some information about the demand side management programs that the utility company offers to um, promote energy efficiency um, in your facility or in your buildings. And then I'll talk about microgrids and also some of the big data and um, artificial intelligence um, advancements that's been going on. So um, why do I uh, keep talking about buildings is that uh, if you think of the overall uh, energy mix um, or the energy sources, um, out of that, uh, about one third of that energy goes into commercial, industrial, and residential sector. And if you think about your generation transmission uh, losses, there's about a one third of energy that's been rejected. So if you need to use one watt of energy in the residential, commercial, industrial sector, you have to at least produce three watts of power at the source. Um, so that's a traditional system. But once you have your renewable energy uh, spread across the different um, areas of your state, you reduce that uh, transmission and distribution losses in the system. So that's one key element. And also buildings can act as kind of a battery storage um, and help the grid um, reduce the load as well. Um, so in in a building in the US, um, we do have um, heating uh, because this is a, a, a cold country, a, a cold climate where you have um, negative temperatures in uh, some, some part of the states. Um, so heating is one of the major contributor um, or energy use in buildings that we see. Um, so a, a typical building, uh, you'd have some fan pump power for uh, heating and cooling. Uh, since all the buildings are sealed, uh, they, they would be air conditioned. So there's uh, not a lot of buildings with natural ventilation. Um, so if you look at a typical energy use in a building uh, for service hot, hot water use or lighting, fan power, this all adds up and not all buildings are the same. You know, a warehouse might not use as much as energy as a, a, a apartment building or a, a retail store or a fitness area. So every building is different. Um, so um, you, you'd have to factor in who are using energy in, in the grid and also uh, how the energy is used. So 
for a typical building, uh, the climate zone matters and also how the building is um, shaped or sized also uh, uh, influences the energy use in the building. Uh, so similar to uh, India's electric grid system, which we have about five uh, sectors like the north, northeast, east, west, and south. Uh, there's a different region uh, where power is pro being produced in the United States. Um, so they, they are also called independent service operators. Um, so there's different ways of curtailing energy um, in the grid. So one is through efficiency measures. Uh, the demand side management program that I talked about is um, how it works is that you know, everyone pay, pays uh, their electric bill. Um, so a portion of that uh, electric bill would be um, assigned to energy efficiency programs. So uh, say RMK is a customer and they're uh, paying to these energy efficiency bills um, as they pay their utility cost every month or every year. And then now they have to build a new campus. Um, so the, the utility company would offer them some incentives or uh, rebates for um, investing in some energy efficiency technology in their building to help reduce the um, energy. So that's some of the energy efficiency incentive programs that have been off offered by different utilities um, to incentivize them to a uh, a more efficient system and adopt some new technologies. Um, so we, um, so on my day-to-day -day, um, activity, we have projects uh, where we uh, consult with uh, architects, engineers, and building owners to um, understand their building, expected building energy use using um, software uh, and we use their software to predict the energy use in the building. And then we'll apply some other uh, technology or measures in um, so in this climate zone we have um, insulation levels and different mechanical systems different lighting systems uh, through that software we uh, analyze how those different components interact with each other um, and saves energy and uh, so we provide that comparative analysis and also provide them with some cost information so that uh, they could make some informed decisions about um, not only investing in the building, but also understanding how that energy savings are going to be adding up over the lifetime. Um, another way to um, way that uh, the utilities have been um, trying to reduce demand is through load shedding. Um, so they could send a signal to the um, the building operators, the building would have uh, automation system. So if they get a signal from the utility, um, the building uh, operator can shed some of the load um, of the building and maybe switch it to a energy storage um, source or a generator um, and they get incentives uh, through that uh, approach. And um, another way uh, we have um, uh, you have um, load shifting um, is uh, through battery storage or uh, when energy prices are low at night, uh, we've seen uh, buildings um, charge up their chilled water system. So they what they do is they run the chillers and create ice and they have this ice bank um, at night. Um, and they build that energy during night when the energy prices are low. And then during the day, when they have uh, such some peak demand, they would recirculate water through that um, loop um, and use that ice storage for cooling the buildings. So, so that's a load shifting um, method to reduce the demand in the grid. And also modulating is uh, sending some, uh, this is, happen at a sub second level, like uh, turning on your compressor in your AC um, so that your demand um, or power to the compressor reduces. And then um, 
so this this all combined together is um, a, a smart city, right? So you have um, your planning of different uh, buildings and different system that goes into your community. And then you have PV, solar PV on the roofs, roof of the buildings. And then you have some wind farms that are sub supplying energy to the building use. And co-generation is a, a combined um, heat and power. So you, you're using your turbines to produce power at site, and then you're using the waste heat to condition the buildings and also use for domestic hot water. Um, and then fuel cells are um, a new uh, technology that uh, uses um, just water to um, produce energy. Um, so it's splitting up hydrogen and oxygen and um, uh, combining them to pro produce energy. And uh, that's more environmental friendly uh, solution compared to like um, IC engines. And um, as I said, energy storage is also a pretty good solution to um, help peak demand situations. And uh, eye landing is, uh, so think of these different uh, cities uh, independent of each other. So they, they have enough uh, resources or capacity to handle their own um, energy needs, and all the other systems are connect interconnected uh, for reliability. So even if one system fails, the other system is independent and can operate on its own. So uh, some places where they have um, um, national security, they would have their independent um, energy sources like hospitals that are serving uh, people in the community, our data centers, they are all, um, they have the capability of being islanded. So they, they have their own resources uh, to operate. Um, and um, so since buildings are one of the most uh, energy consumers that um, technology in those buildings help talk to each other. So it's it's a two two way communication. It's no longer a one way street from a, a power flow from the utility to the building. It's it's more of a two way communication since the building technologies have the cap capacity for energy storage. They have uh, PV on the roof, so when they don't have much load on the building, they can store that energy and then use it when the demand in the utility is high. Um, we have a few utilities here um, in the US which offers time of use pricing. So basically when the demand is high, they would increase the price of uh, energy in the building. So you'd get real, real time updates. Um, so even if it's a, a residential customer, um, it's basically saying you're now paying uh, five rupees per unit and at between noon and one o'clock, your energy price is going to be 15 rupees per unit. So uh, when you're doing laundry or any other uh, activity that might increase your energy use, you'd think twice before doing that. So it's more of a bringing behavioral change. Um, so having that capability to talk to the utility real time is more valuable for um, reducing energy in the grid. And smart meters are also helpful um, to look at your meter data live through your smartphones or any other building automation systems. And buildings are getting advanced and these technologies are not only used for energy, but also in some of the highly populated area where real estate is uh, very expensive. They use some of the lighting technologies or occupancy sensor technologies to see who are all in the room um, so that they could help with scheduling. And also if they're bringing in outside air, they could bring uh, bring fresh air based on how many people are in the room actually. Um, and then um, um, thermal mass is also one of the things when, in, especially in cold climates where if they're not poorly insulated, they lose all the heat in the building immediately. 
so term increasing your insulation of the wall and roof helps retain the heat in the building or even uh, if you um, are cooling the building it helps uh, prevent heat entering into the building during summer um, I, there are a few other buzzwords in uh, big data and AI that I wanted to share. Um, uh, one is uh, capital investment uh, based on load growth. So as people start expanding and uh, moving and start building new buildings, uh, we um, have softwares that predict where people are moving and how the load growth is expected so that um, utility can um, expand their territory and make smart investments. Um, smart meters help um, the customers look at energy data real time so that they could uh, monitor and control their energy use in the building. Um, net metering is uh, a new concept, a concept that helps you sell energy. So say you're using uh, 20 kilowatt hour energy every day, and then you're having some renewable energy like solar and producing 25 or 30 kilowatt hour um, per day. So you could sell that excess energy back to the grid and um, get credit on your electric uh, bill uh, based on how much energy you sell. So it's more of a two-way communication. Um, and then smart thermostats um, help you um, program your house set points based on when you're occupying the space or when you're not occupying. And we've also had the smart thermostat um, controlled by the utility companies. So it's, it's more of an opt-in program. If you wish to participate in that program, the utility company would directly control your thermostat um, in say in a peak summer condition, um, they would pre-cool your building um, about two degrees. So if you're set to um, 25 degrees Celsius, um, they'll pre-cool it to 24, 23, and then uh, turn off the AC for a particular period of time. And um, if you wish to participate, then you will get some financial incentives uh, for doing so. Uh, Internet of Things is also um, something that's been um, spreading around recently with uh, smart gadgets and all everyone carrying a smartphone in their pocket. Um, I also do have a lot of uh, smart devices at home that controls light and also other devices. Uh, so you could basically turn on and off your um, devices using your mobile and also helps program all the different um, energy consuming equipment in the, in the building uh, just from your smart, smartphone. And uh, by having this technology, you could also uh, think um, in a bigger scale, like for, a, for office or any other retail, you could have this um, on a broader scale and not have lights going on all the time. Uh, behavioral change is something that I talked about is uh, having um, the company provide some uh, financial um, rate um, decrease so that you, you could you know do laundry two or three hours later um, or uh, if, you, if you're thinking of a commercial building you could uh, postpone some of your process load uh, a couple of hours so that uh, the grid is not stressed and they don't have to um, call in a peak, peaking power plant to come in uh, to serve the peak demand situation. And demand response is, um, again, it's the it's signal back from the utility to uh, the building so that they could turn off their load or use some of their existing backup um, so that the grid is not strained. And we've been talking a lot about uh, grid decarbonization or beneficial electrification here um, since most of the building use um, gasoline to heat their buildings or even propane um, in some cases. And uh, those have a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and then now switching to uh, different heat pump technologies or uh, VRF technologies help um, avoid that increase uh, carbon emission into the atmosphere. So 
<coughs> using a, a system that can use electricity and you're um, pumping in more clean um, or renewable energy into the grid and using that for conditioning your space. So it's more of a cyclic process and it, I think it will take um, a few years to get to that path. But as we are moving uh, forward, uh, there's a lot of um, grid, the renewable energy penetration into the grid, which is making it more cleaner and helping with climate change. And um, another piece of the coin while um, designing buildings, what we've been thinking with all the pandemic is um, we, we are turning more into an indoor species. If you think about how much time you spend in a building, um, we spend about 80 to 90% of our time inside. And now I think that the uh, pandemic uh, is spending most of the time indoors. So making those indoor environment um, not only energy efficient, but also uh, safe and uh, being healthy. Um, uh, designing the buildings to make it more healthy to, to the occupants is also a critical um, part of the design that we've been incorporating. And also, I, I forgot to talk about network security in the previous slide. Um, since you have a lot of widgets connected to the internet, there's also a risk of uh, hacking or getting your information leaked through any of the um, network entry or uh, IP. So uh, network security is something that the utilities are um, paying attention to so that your information is not um, shared or you don't gain access to any other building's data through this mesh network. Um, and um, finally, concluding that um, you know we've been contributing to global uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also towards climate change. And with the Paris Agreement to uh, prevent that two degree um, increase uh, in global temperature is um, something that we've been driving towards uh, a big. Uh, broken bridge. Uh, so we're trying to reverse the effect of um, climate change. So um, energy efficiency is the first step towards that after conservation. And then you um, see as buildings get efficient and more uh, renewable energy uh, gets added to the grid um, and combined with storage and uh, um, electrification, I think that's um, more of a, a path towards uh, a greener future. And um, as I said in the beginning, that there's not one size fits all solution. So it's more like a combination of all these technologies that have to go and play hand in hand um, to avoid that um, overall global um, increase in temperature. And uh, we've been um, talking about more about buildings, which is about um, 60 to 70 percent of your energy um, and greenhouse gas emissions and then the 40 percent of the energy is used by transport sector and that's also something um, that the utility companies here have been promoting to switch to electric vehicles or hybrids so that um, you're having lower emissions uh, they've been trans um, transferring um, buses that operate on gas to electric transit or even um, um, mixed fuels so that it works on both battery and gasoline. So that's that's something that I'm pretty interested to looking uh, looking at because there's a lot of charging stations popping up um, around. So I personally don't own an electric vehicle. I do drive a hybrid. So that's one step that I've taken to help climate change and also uh, take comfort in the fact that I uh, worked with a lot of building design earlier on to uh, consult and help them um, take some energy efficient decisions uh, before they design so that uh, the savings adds up over the lifetime, uh, whether it's 50 or 100 years, uh, as long as the building stands, they're, they're saving energy. Um, 
So I see a, a lot of uh, hands raising. I'm just going to uh, conclude here and uh, see if I could answer any of the questions that you may have. Any questions from audience? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, I'd like to know, uh, or I'd like to ask to give you more uh, uh, detail about this US power markets, because uh, they mainly uh, focus on this uh, independent system operators. There are power, the power exchanges there, and they have uh, the uh, uh, power uh, separate uh, rights over there and uh, load entities are there so that the market system is entirely different from Indian market system. So if you could give some details about that, the students might have some idea of what is the difference between Indian power market and uh, US power market. Sure. Uh, so usually they have a day ahead market. So based on the expected load, they would um, commit some um, load price with power plants. And um, that's kind of a day ahead market. And then if there's a peaking power plant that has to come off online um, during some of that high demand period, they would have to um, pay more. Um, I do not work on those um, contracts, but I've, I've seen that um, the price of electricity here um, in the Midwest is around 12 to 13 cents per kilowatt hour. And then in the East Coast or the West Coast where you have um, a lot of demand, uh, the price goes up to uh, up to around 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and it, it depends based on the region as well. So it, it depends on the mix of fuel stream that you have. Um, so a hydropower uh, cost would be different from a, a solar a solar farm or also, uh, especially in Iowa, about 42% of the um, energy that uh, is in the grid is from wind energy. So they... And, and those are owned by utility companies and they are um, sort of an investor owned utility. So they um, own that generation and then uh, they charge separate for transmission distribution. Okay, sir. So, Thank you. That's another question, sir. Yeah. Tell us about energy security, economic benefits, and clean energy integration of microgrid. Um, so energy security um, is uh, mostly having your data private um, so that, um, one second, I'm just looking back to this question again. Um, so energy security, you could talk about um, you know, your information privacy. Um, and if you're talking about reliability, uh, it's having those different um, systems in place so that when, when you have a power failure or if you have high demand situation, you could have a second source of energy that's available. Um, economic benefits is, um, it's helping the environment and also there's a, a strong business case for um, owners or building operators to have a reliable source. Um, and one other um, thing that I haven't mentioned is about equity. Uh, this is meaning that uh, everyone has accessible to reliable and um, resilient um, grid access. So not only the rich people who are having, um, having these uh, extra cash to invest in energy efficiency benefit from this. It's it's about having everyone or um, all the all the customers access to these resources and um, um, technology. So that's um, a, a societal factor that plays into this um, 
solution. Um, and then clean energy integration into the microgrid is, um, I could think of, um, you know, like your uh, solar panels or community farms that they've been installing um, at parking lots to um, help um, inject solar into uh, cities where you have some real estate issues. Um, and then there's also um, certain communities who purchase the land and it's kind of a co-op. So 10, 15 people purchase the land by our invest in solar in that farm and then use that energy from that farm to sell to a particular business entity. And they have some power purchase plan um, based on you know, capital cost and other operation costs. They have a levelized cost of energy for those solar plants. And then they could sell the credits for producing certain amount of clean energy back to um, corporates who um, show, show those certificates for their corporate um, society, their CSR programs. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have another question. Uh, sir, uh, the power purchase is mainly uh, by bidding process in US, right, sir? Um, I'm not sure about that um, because I don't work in that field. Okay, so then uh, how do you uh, relate this uh, reliability or your uh, work towards this uh, market price, sir? Like, do you have any relation between this uh, reliability of supply? Because the price changes daily. So that's something that the pretty signs um, into agreement with the customer that they would have some off on peak and off peak windows uh, for summer and winter. And that's uh, pretty much set as an agreement ahead of time. And then um, as they have some peak window um, or uh, peak constraints, they would notify the, the building owner or the customer um, so that their building automation system can um, easily uh, take that signal as uh, a clue and then uh, transfer some of the load to their um, storage sources or even their um, generation, alternate generation sources. So it's it's a varying time of use rate that they call, and it's it's already set ahead of uh, time. Okay, so that's another question. What are the major factors in deployment of microgrids? And also, uh, they're asking about something about cascading outages. Sure, that's a good question. So. Um, the benefits is that, uh, you know, like for a natural disaster or any other situation that um, you have, um, you don't have access to the grid source, you have um, some sort of a backup um, that can run critical systems um, and not use, um, you know, diesel or some, some other form of um, generator that has a higher potential for a greenhouse gas. Um, so this is more of an um, environmental friendly uh, solution by integrating renewables and also uh, building technologies that can um, adapt to that uh, energy source. And um, what was the other part? The cascading- Cascading part. outages. Uh, So these, these systems are um, usually uh, connected, but it's it's protected at the building level. So um, if, you, if you think about just a, as a community um, or a, a microgrid, um, I think they have some sort of uh, uh, isolation uh, transformer that can and prevent if there's any voltage fluctuation, they could um, disconnect or um, not cause one system um, 
transfer the fault to the next system. So they do have some, some sort of a, a circuit breaker or isolation transformer to prevent that kind of a cascade problem. Sir, uh, what are the vulnerable points or vulnerabilities which occur in this market system? Whether you have handled any such uh, problem as a uh, project manager? Um, problems. Uh, so, one one issue is with the utilities um, trying to be equitable. Um, it's making sure that their investments that they have um, is able to serve all the community and not just the um, the urban community. They they also have customers in the rural areas. Um, so when when they do certain investments, they're out they have to make a, a business case um, and make sure that uh, everyone in the community agrees to that project. So that's uh, one thing that we've seen as kind of a hurdle coming up is equity. Because when everyone starts to um, go offline or have their independent stores, then you're left with this in, um, the transmission and distribution infrastructure that the remaining people are left to pay for. So that might lead to um, an increased uh, rate price for the people who cannot afford those um, exact kind of uh, efficient system, if you will. That's another question, sir. What is the deployed capacity of microgrid in US as of now? Um, so we've seen uh, about uh, two to three megawatt of uh, capacity uh, just for a, a small community level. Um, but we're yet to see uh, kind of a large scale to a 400 or 500 megawatt. Uh, but I've, I've been hearing on the news that there's a lot of smart cities that are coming up, uh, which are in design right now. Another question, what is the expected growth expectancy? Um, the growth expectancy of microgrids, you mean? Yes, maybe. Somebody has posted, might be. Uh, so, so the first thing, um, apart from microgrid, we are seeing um, electrification as one of the key component. Um, everyone having um, the, the the purchase of electric vehicles have been going on significantly in the U.S., uh, which in turn adds load to the system. And then um, with uh, some of the California wildfires that they've had, um, there's been explosions with, with buildings which has gas use. So they've mandated all new construction to switch to 100% electric only buildings and not use any of the, the um, fossil fuels in, in the buildings. So that's uh, slowly increasing the load portfolio. So I think as, as the, the grid uh, capacity is, is peaked and, and they don't um, have any other way apart from increasing the utility prices, uh, that's when you when you see that other um, um, renewable energy so sources being more um, financially viable. So, in, especially in the Midwest, where you have the cost of energy being so low compared to the East and West Coast, it's it's hard to make a business case uh, for those uh, renewable energy or microgrids at this point. Uh, but especially where you have, um, like in New York, where your utility costs are twice the amount of um, prices in the Midwest. Um, in that area, 
uh, and their real estates are so high and you need that uh, reliability as a key component that's that's where we've been seeing some of the investment right now um, and then slowly as uh, market starts to adopt the technology then overall your cost of implementing those systems would ra- gradually go low so there's a there's a implementation period um, over which your cost of the systems comes down and that's when we could see um, more microgrid or distributed energy resources being uh, popping up everywhere um, and not just only on those hot spots. No, I so have a query. The, yeah. Yeah. Shall I? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So in, the, in your presentation, I could see one uh, graph of efficiency versus time of the day. Yeah. Yeah, efficiency was going down and then picking up, etc. So, can I say efficiency is directly related to the percentage of load on the system, or what is the relation like efficiency variation with respect to the time of the day? Uh, so, if you could see the graph here on the top, this is the usage before uh, making some retrofits to the building. So basically you're changing light bulbs or replacing your mechanical system. Um, so your overall load profile is going down and that's what- Can you please show that uh, graph once again? Sure. Sorry, I didn't see that it wasn't sharing my screen. So you do you see the gray, yeah. gray yeah. line on top? So this was the previous usage. And then after you implemented certain strategies like uh, changing out your mechanical systems or adding controls, that's when you see the load portfolio come down uh, a notch from what was before. So it's overall reducing the portfolio and not changing. So your usage is the same, but the, the magnitude has reduced. Magnitude, magnitude, so, megawatt demand has reduced or megawatt utilization right. has reduced. Right, right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, when the consumption is somewhere near 85 to 90 percentage, can I say efficiency will be high? Um, so, uh, this is the... between efficiency and the load? So, the efficiency is based on the 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 technology that you're implementing basically. So say if you have uh, any occupancy sensors in the building that can turn off the system when people are not occupying. So in in some cases you'd see uh, a building that's been conditioned all day and all night. Now you have this occupancy sensors that, you know, turn off conditioning when there's not people. So this portfolio would change based on the building um, type this is just an uh, example graph showing how you could reduce the demand, uh, but the efficiency of a particular system would be um, tied to that technology that we're talking about. So that's another, another question, sir. Ma'am? Uh, you can, you can, yeah. Uh, could you tell us the uh, role rural and remote microgrid in developing countries? That's a really good question. So where they don't have those infra- infrastructure built uh, for transmission lines, I think that's that's a really good um, business case when, when you have the solar, uh, especially um, solar and wind being a really good um, potential uh, sources of energy coupled with battery storage is is something that uh, would be definitely viable in the rural areas. Um, in the US at least, you have about three to four months um, of snowfall. And if you think of the, the sunrise and sunset times, um, in the summer, the sunset is around eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night. But in the winter, you um, it'll be dark by three or four o'clock in the afternoon. 
so they have shortened um sunlight period especially for solar panels here but in say in india where you have this uh, predictable uh, sunlight hours and also uh, wind potential i think um, that energy source coupled with energy storage uh, would be a really good um, solution to, for having that uh, distributed or micro grids solution thank you sir so then another question uh, sir your views on wireless transmission of electricity yeah um that's that's uh, interesting we've been only seeing that in mobile phones here um but um and there are um battery charging stations which do wireless charging but um i think we are we're still um a little bit behind in that game to have that commercialized so that's another question i think uh, three questions but i can put it as one so what's the, the frequency is 60 hertz in us correct yeah so what are the merits of that and uh, if it is possible in, in india so as a three question i have merged it as one merits of 60 hertz I, i don't think there's any merit it's just how things were set up in the beginning that india followed 50 and that stuck with it and then in the us they do everything upside down and they have different units for temperature for distance measurement so i think that's also one of the quirky things about us this sir can i add the, to this yeah frequency influences the uh, magnetic losses Oh. hysteresis and eddy current losses so that is the only difference otherwise constructionally it is already implemented in all the countries they follow it am i correct yeah as uh, sir could you please uh, tell the students uh, this importance of this marketing study of this marketing and uh, pricing regarding this uh, energy because uh, it will be much useful for them you have a great scope here right sir sure yeah and um, so that it is it is very important to look at the uh, system implementation on on, on a various angles uh, from technical perspective as well as um, your financial perspective so approaching any um solution with those um not only the technology aspect but also the the financial aspect and also um the the environmental aspect is very important to have kind of a holistic thinking so if if you are um thinking of implementing this um uh, smart grid solution anywhere you'd have to make a business case so uh, it it is very important to have that additional skill of uh, looking at finances and also um looking at the rate of return for those uh, business cases so not only a person who's um interested in environment could implement it but also uh, a kind of a business man or investor can um can be a part of this transformation thank you sir there's another question what are the legal and regulatory challenges in microgrid so uh, a legal issue is that you're not allowed to sell power to your neighbor um, or sell power to your even um, a building across the street so there's a little bit of uh, the uh, rules and um red tape to navigate here um and apart from that uh there are really good um mandates that the city or the state requires even though uh, us has um 
back down from the Paris Treaty, um, the state and the local uh, regulatory uh, agencies have been pushing towards uh, energy efficiency. So they've been a little bit critical about um, pushing energy efficiency technologies in the market. So, Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other question is there? Hello? Yeah. No, no. Okay, no. we close. We close the section now, ma'am. Close for Nilamam. Yeah. We wind up the section now? Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, Mahesh, sir. Good we'll wind up the section now, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating and also having this opportunity to talk to you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I request uh, Sabri ma'am to give a word of thanks. Uh, sir, that's another question. Can microgrid be privatized? Uh, depending on the local regulatory, uh, depending on who you're selling to, there are few solar uh, community solar projects that you basically can enter into an ag agreement with someone. So, yeah, if you're an investor and if you could go to a particular community and convince them to buy power from you, I think it's it can be done. But On behalf of okay. our management, uh, uh, principal sir, head of the department, faculty, and student participants, I'd like to extend my warm thanks to Mr. Uh, Bino for delivering a wonderful uh, session regarding the power system resilience. It is really wonderful to hear about the different uh, market areas about US and also how uh, how important it is to uh, concentrate on reliable power supply. And you have also created more interest regarding this uh, concentration on market uh, price and uh, developing and career towards this uh, uh, economy in electrical engineering. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your wonderful session. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Sabri, ma'am. <clears throat> on all on behalf, I sincerely thanks to um, Vinod for the wonderful section today. And once again, I go lastly. Since um, thank you to the, our management, then uh, principal sir and the HOD ma'am for supporting us to conduct this successful semi uh, successful webinar. And also, I sincerely thanks to Kavita Madam for arranging this uh, webinar. And also, I sincerely thanks to our system admin, Ishwaran sir. Uh, you know, from starting day, he was, uh, he was uh, along with us for conducting this successful webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinod. Thank On you. behalf of everybody, it was so Thank wonderful. You, uh, there are a lot of questions that I have. I will discuss later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm more concerned about all the deviations, all the graphs that you plotted. We will discuss it later. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sabri ma'am, Kirpani la. Sabri ma'am, end the section for the law. Sabri ma'am. Ah, okay, sir. Sure, sir. YouTube, YouTube, uh, either you end on it, YouTube, uh, YouTube stop by some bag. You sure, sir? End on it in the submarine. Yeah. Vishal Sarkara.
ಹಲೋ 